We're at the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, and I am a partnerships manager at All Voices. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am very excited to welcome our guest today, Carissa Begonia, founder of Conscious Exchange. Hi, Carissa. How are you doing? Hi, Christina. How are you? I'm doing I'm- well. I'm good. I'm good. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, including your pronouns and one of your hobbies outside of work, we'll get started there. Hobbies outside of work. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm Carissa Vagonia. I am a first generation Filipino American daughter of immigrants. Um, I'm also a leadership and business coach. I specialize specifically in working with BIPOC leaders and entrepreneurs. I really help them to pursue meaningful careers um, and build their own values driven businesses and ultimately to design a life of purpose. Um, I was the former head of diversity and inclusion for Zappos a few years ago. Um, and before I kind of went into the human side of business, I was spent more of my time, about 15 years on the operations side um, at some of the largest retailers, such as Macy's, Saks Fifth Avenue, Ross stores, um, et cetera. And now I find myself as a diversity, equity, inclusion consultant, um, mostly supporting small businesses, medium-sized businesses, um, really looking at the both systemic and interpersonal and personal um, you know, relationships um, and racism with this anti-racist lens and anti-oppression lens. So my work is very personal. I love to do the, what I do um, and I get, and I love that I get to do it every day. So it's a little bit about me. And uh, one more thing is I also am the fa- co-founder of um, Arise, which stands for Asian, Ameri- Asian American Racialized Identity and Social Empowerment. Um, and that was a program that was really born out of uh, the pandemic last year with all these um, unfortunate hate crimes against Asian Americans. And so I'm really proud of that program um, as well that I have co-founded with partners, uh, Sheng Xiao Yu and Julia Berryman. So that's a little bit about me. And in terms of hobbies, something that I like to do outside of work, um, something that's been calling me lately is creativity. I feel like I've had this huge um, kind of pull, I guess, like spiritual pull towards doing things that are creative and artistic. Um, and that's important to me right now because I think for a long time, potentially from my Asian American identity, I have also internalized this model minority myth of doing things that are very you know, um, academic or just work driven. And I own that personality for a long time. And so when I'm feeling now, I'm also very spiritual and I'm feeling the sense of moving towards um, creativity, um, I'm not ignoring that calling. And so what that manifests in is more singing. So I've been um, trying to take some singing lessons. I've sung in choirs for a long time, like um, just part of like college or um, what's it called, Uh, like church and such. Um, And so I love singing. My grandmother was an opera singer. My mother sings. Um, I've always been shy about it um, because I think, again, this is part of my journey and my growth of of being very emotional. and it was too emotional to be to be a singer. So, so vulnerable. Now to embrace, excuse me. It's so vulnerable to sing, yeah. Absolutely, and I, you know that being vulnerable, being outspoken, it's been part of this journey. And so, as I'm talking, and now I'm like, why don't you sing, Carissa? <laughs> 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 um, and so, yes, I've been just exploring that a lot lately, and how I can start to use my voice in a different way. That's amazing. I love that we're all about manifestation and just you know putting yourself out there as well. I love to to see that energy and not ignoring the calling that you you're feeling too. Uh, You talked about this a little bit as well in terms of your work in diversity, equity, and inclusion and your role with consulting companies right now as part of your, the many things that you do with your business. But I would love to dig a little bit deeper into what really, you know, inspired you to get into diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, as well. Yeah. So I like to say that DEI work was a mistake for me. Like I, it was not part of my plan. And if you saw my resume for you know the first 10, 15 years of my career, it was planner. I literally have the role, the title planner in my, um, we're ty- planner in my title. And um, it was a merchandise planner for retail. So it was analysis, trends, forecasting, finances, all of that. Um, And I I loved it. I was really good at it. But um, I found myself uh, climbing the ladder pretty quickly, which was awesome, right? (laughs) Um, I think as you start to get 
more into higher level senior positions, you start to kind of see about how to navigate these, unfortunately, very homogenous white spaces. Um, and so navigating that successfully, finally earning my seat at the table. Um, and I got there and I was like, good job, Carissa. You're like, I was the youngest. I was, you know, the woman of color, a female, um, new to the company. And I was like, good job. And I pat myself on the back, but then after I, I looked around, I was like, well, well, why? Um, what? Like, you know, why am I the only one here? Um, it just was a curiosity. And unfortunately, at some point, I think like a lot of us, um, as we climb those ranks, we start to run in as whether it's as an identity as a woman, um, a woman of color. Mm -hmm. I was starting to notice it was getting challenging, and I was working with very alpha males at one point, like three very alpha males. Okay. And um, I think I was matching that energy and I was, you know, pretty outspoken. And I, I was, it was another level for me of just aggression. Um, and I didn't like it. And I was, I was feeling mm -hmm. exhausted and, you know, just, just not myself like every day. And I so sought out the help of other women, female leaders at the company. Cause I was like, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not the only one here. I know it. I'm too, I'm too new, too young here to be the only one. And so I ended up making friends with a lot of different executives at my company, a lot of different female leaders. And it was just this sense of wanting to be together and support each other. Um, and just, you know, just be in relationship, right. And help each other out. Um, I ended up creating a women's group, um, at my last company, uh, Zappos, um, just again in leadership, I was like, okay, like here I am again. Like I'd love to just meet other female leaders. And so I ended up creating this women's group. I ran that in parallel to my normal job function. Yep. Um, and just, you know, on the side for free, for funsies, if you will, just because I wanted that relationship. I wanted to do things for other, for other folks at the yeah. company as well. Um, so I was hosting like workshops, I was hosting like events and speaker series, fireside chats, whatnot. Um, and then at some point I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I don't want to do my work work anymore. I want to do this. Um, right. And I knew they weren't going to pay me to run a women's group. <laughs> um, and so I pitched there. I noticed that there wasn't a formal diversity, equity, inclusion office at Zappos. And I was like, oh okay, like maybe there's an opportunity here. At the time, Tony, the unfortunately, the, the late Tony Shea had created this uh, environment in which we could basically pitch ideas about how to improve the company, which is mm -hmm. really awesome. And um, I pitched this idea to, we should have a DEI office um, and I want to run it. And, you know, presented that to the C-suite. They gave it to me. <laughs> I'm like, okay, great, awesome. And then I immediately had imposter syndrome. I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> not study, you know, ethnic studies or anything like this in, mm -hmm. in school. And so I took some grad classes. Um, I went to become a coach in, in, in emotional intelligence because I was really adamant about EQ being sort of like foundational to the work we were going to do. Um, and that was kind of that journey. You know, I, I didn't seek this out. It was more, I see gaps, I see opportunities mm -hmm. and I if I, I'm like, I'm passionate about them, I'm like, I'm gonna go pitch it and ask for it. And, you know, that's served me well. But also I think that again, that, that moment of like, what am I doing? Um, it really helped me kind of think about not how, what am I doing for the company, but also introspectively, what am I doing for myself? Absolutely. Um, and yeah, so some of this work, again, I say, this is really personal work um, because in that role, it wasn't so much that I was, yes, I was do, getting to create and do these, um, these, change things at the, at the company, but what I found was a lot more internal. Um, and I had done a lot of introspection and uh, work around my own cultural identity. And I realized, it, yes, maybe my formal role was here, but I had been doing this work or I had been thinking about this way long before. One of my first, um, my one of my first kind of forays, if you will, into diversity, equity, inclusion was as a child, I won this like MTV, like, uh, like, it was some kind of diversity contest um, <laughs> I think in like sixth grade or something. And so when I kind of looked at my journey um, and one of, unfortunately, where this really stems from was my first experience with racism at mm -hmm. around nine years old um, and how that carried through my life on pretty subconsciously. But when I looked back, I was like, okay, that was one significant experience. Another one again was winning this MTV award as like, you know, this local kid. And then, uh, going into college and being part of the diversity office there. My first job at a school was at Macy's and I started at ERG for millennials before millennials was even a, 
a term, you know, um, because I was surrounded by a bunch of 20 year olds, like, you right. know, like an assistant at that time. Um, and I was like, well, why aren't we doing something that really leverages this, this, you know, bucket of, of folks um, that I'm constantly talking to and surrounded by. So, and then, you know, fast forward to my most formal role as a, you know, head of diversity and then now diversity consultant. So this work isn't, it, if I look at it, yeah, maybe I did it back in 2016 formally, right? But it's been following me or I've been doing this since I was nine, I guess, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah. No, absolutely. And it's definitely, it's clearly a passion of yours and it's a personal kind of tie to this work as well because it's not like, it's a lot of emotional labor and it's a lot of things that you really want to put this passion and effort towards as well. And I see this kind of common thread in between the experiences that you've shared too, of just like seeing that there is, like you said, a gap in the business and wanting to really fill that with really important programming and education and just an array of things that we're also seeing a lot of large organizations really do in response to the anti-racist movement, in response to a lot of world events that are going on right now as well. And one of the questions that I definitely wanted to ask you too was, especially with larger organizations who have a lot of different folks at the company and who are just starting out this work and maybe building out a diversity, equity, and inclusion director role or a VP role um, and really building out employee resource groups. Like where, where do you think that they should start in really addressing, you know, a strategy um, and really starting that foundation? Yeah, I think um, it's a couple, there's so much. Um, yeah. I think you are, chief diversity officers or heads of diversity, they're often under-resourced and often like the sole person um, carrying the entire company. Um, and mm -hmm. frankly, that's it's unrealistic to yeah. put that responsibility on as a CDO or chief diversity officer. Um, kind of, I think some of the way we were even looking at CDOs, programming, content, like all the, everything around diversity right now, I think is being challenged and has this opportunity to be different. Um, so I think one of the first things I'll say is be imaginative and creative. Um, there's a responsibility for sure, but I think we have, things have been, are very different pre-2020 um, to now. And so we right now, for instance, I wasn't talking about race very much pre 2020. And now if you do not talk about race, what are we talking about? <laughs> right? hey. um, and yes, there's intersectionality and there's so many different identities to talk about, but race has been one that has been, I think tr more traditionally avoided in, 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 yeah. like, in direct conversations. Um, and I think this is the time, which means also since we haven't been doing it, it's a little, it's a lot uncomfortable actually. Um, and we're not sure how exactly to approach it. I think if anyone's saying, I know how to do this, I know the way, um, I call BS a little bit. You know? <laughs> I think we're all trying and figuring that out and we have to do that collaboratively. So all that to say, um, I think there's two things that happen. One, we look really external um, outside of ourselves and to think about all the systemic change that needs to be made. And absolutely, I think it's both personal and, and personal, personal and interpersonal, as well as systemic changes that, need, that are needed. I think we run quickly to the, what can we do more systemically and look at the HR policies, look at, you know, even our, our statement to begin with, you know, what our values are, um, what is the strategy overall for the company? What is the, you know, benefits that we're gonna put in, the recruitment um, kind of, and pipeline strategies. So, and, you know, PR and marketing, right? So we look externally, but we don't spend a lot of the time internally. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I think regardless if you've had a personal experience with say racism or um, other kind of ism that is, is oppressive, we, we don't know sometimes why it matters to us or what our relationship is to it. And that's why, you know, I'm still adamant as, as much as I was adamant at Zappos to implement uh, these, the skill set of emotional intelligence. Um, I think it's because what EQ teaches you is a lot of that introspection, that awareness building for self, excuse me, and for others and empathy for others. And I'm not writing that empathy is the only, is the answer to every, everything, but is part of it, right? And I think a lot of things are happening, they're dual tracking, they're happening at the same time, right? So it's not like, hey, let's do the interpersonal or impersonal stuff before we do the systemic stuff. It's, it's together. But I think we put a lot of focus on what are the things we can do outside of ourselves, even interpersonally, right? The relationships and such, and not so much of like what's driving us first like internally. So what I would say is um, in the beginning, potentially starting off with 
you know, some of these KPIs, representation does matter, but it's not the end all be all. So if we don't have any KPIs, we have to start to determine what that actually even is defined as. And I wish I could say that that was much more black and white as metrics should be, but they're not, you know, in in social change. And so um, one first benchmark, sure, could be kick those KPIs in terms of like demographics and of of the organization, because a lot of companies, you'll be surprised, don't even know what that kind of data looks like, right? Right. Um, And then looking at that from a not just like a aggregated overall level, but start to chop that data up and understand the stories that are going on there. You know, is leadership looking very different from the overall population, right? Um, that's often something that you find when you start to disaggregate that data. Um, so that representation, but beyond that too, right? Even like, I, I, I'm not fully versed in all this. I know there's other consultants that do more of this work in terms of psychological safety and be able to measure that. Like, I think that's really interesting and in how people are developing measurements for that um, beyond potentially these just surveys and belonging and like happiness and such. So I think that's an interesting new uh, approach. Um, but sometimes like even the first thing is, and it, it, it could be anecdotal. I think, again, we're looking for like the, the solution um, to some social problems in that manifest in the workplace. And I think we miss sometimes just that very, that heart center, like checking in with our employees, with our, our colleagues and how, like on a very human level. You know, I remember when the verdict of Breonna Taylor came out and again, I think there were these companies that were rushing to have a statement. And I'm like, did you check in on your black employees? Did you have... Did you just have like some kind of care thing? What, you know, bring in some therapists maybe or yeah. um, folks who could handle these conversations? Like it was so much about saving face and so much about what I what statement I need to put out there um, that you're missing the point of like the folks right. who were actually impacted and affected. Um, and so I just return people back to like to operating from the heart. And I feel like sometimes that's and at odds when you're thinking about corporations who are bottom line driven and just about money, right? But um, yeah, like coming back to humanity and taking care of one another um, is it's gonna. It, that's I think the re- almost revolutionary in, in these organizations now. Absolutely, I think internal work is really important. And what I hear you saying as well too is that people definitely can tell when you are just trying to check the box and just like respond to and just be reactive to a moment. And I think that's a really good example because you really do need to create space, especially for this instance with Brianna Taylor for your black employees and just really actively listen. And like you said, there's a difference between like listening and hearing or actively and empathetically listening and then taking action after that, which I think is really important. And another um, kind of point that you brought up as well is just measuring the ROI of just a strategy that's about psychological safety, about inclusion and belonging, which is really sometimes hard to measure. Do you have any other kind of thoughts around how people should really meaningfully measure their strategy, knowing that it's different for everyone and it has to go beyond representation, it has to go beyond like retention and promotion of employees as well, um, just to continually like have a dynamic diversity, equity and inclusion strategy in place. Yeah, like I said, I think even how we're starting to measure ROI is evolving and changing. I think um, because DEI is not the norm, having an office or having a person responsible for this is not the norm in companies. Um, so I think even how, how big is your team? You know, like how are you developing the, you know, you go from the, the one chief diversity officer or the one program manager or director. Um, are we putting as, uh, resources and funding towards growing this team to actually be representative of the company, right? Yeah. And when you look at, so I think there's metrics even like, again, those seem simple, but like how, how have we increased funding and how have we increased resourcing okay, people into, these, into this work? Um, even how, what kind of programming are we looking at, right? Um, some, again, I think there's the, oh, we checked the box as we celebrated, you know, APAM is in May and folks are like getting, I'm, I'm being hired for, for speaking engagements for that. Uh, and I'm often having these conversations like this, I hope this isn't a one-time thing, right? And even if it's not in May and we do this in June or July or <laughs> October, it doesn't right? have to be in May. <laughs> it doesn't have to be May. Um, what's the continuation of your programming, you know? And I, I hope it's not just the one-off because that is performative. That is just checking the box, right? How does this feed into your larger kind of strategy? Um, and right now I have to say, my experience has been that there is a disconnect still, right? And there isn't this much longer um, 
uh, strategy. And, you know, we're kind of picking out the identities that are obvious, like one, no, like race, right? Um, but that doesn't mean we're not talking about like LGBTQ, LGBTQIA plus and, right. or, you know, disability or um, what's it called? Ageism. We're not, you know, we're not, well, there's other identities to be exploring. And I think right now, yes, we're focused on race, um, which is great because I feel like we've been absent of that conversation for some time. Um, but there's so much work and this is ongoing. And so I think even like something as simple as how, like what, what programs did you run this year versus last year? Right. What is the, what's that strategy going forward to increase that again in personnel who's going to, who's actually going to run them. Another thing I, another kind of way I want to start to look at diversity of inclusion is um, in terms of like business units having representatives, right? I don't know that a lot of, again, because the resourcing isn't there, but if you think about a chief diversity officer, their skill set, you know, maybe they've been doing this for 20 years, which I think is also still a minority of like, <laughs> many folks have been right. have had a role for that long. Um, but you know, there's a they're in a vertical. They probably spent their lives either studying, you know, getting their PhDs, or they, you know, spent their 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 like careers in maybe in a marketing capacity or legal capacity you know, an HR capacity, whatnot, right? And so that means like you didn't spend your time in another capacity, in another vertical, right? Um, or functional expertise. And I think what I always look at for diversity and inclusion is that we inherently as the leaders, we, uh, we owe nothing actually, but we have the power to impact everything, mm -hmm. right? And so it's hard, it's difficult to challenge a chief diversity officer to be uh, an expert at marketing and PR and communications and an expert in HR and an expert in um, recruitment and an expert in just a whole slew of things, right? right. And so I feel like starting to see when I say measurement and meaning more resourcing, it's because I want to start to see most business units um, have leaders um, who are focused on this type of work. Um, and with those, again, with that kind of functional expertise. So it's not just about a diversity of cultural identity or just uh, different identities, but it's also one of um, functional expertise um, that I think when we look at these teams and yes, teams, not singular consultants, not singular heads of diversity, that um, you can start to have the breadth of like experience and knowledge, um, both lived and and, and the workplace um, to drive these initiatives forward um, in meaningful ways. Absolutely. And I think it's also important when you're talking about business units as well, that there's other buy-in from stakeholders within the business, because we know that a chief diversity officer is not going to solve an organization's problems or just like bring those benchmarks up because everybody needs to look at things from an intersectional lens and also just bring it into their work and be culture champions, diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of champions as well to understand and again, do that internal work. Something else that you mentioned was kind of being performative. A lot of heritage months are coming up as well. And I wanted to know if there are any other kind of misconceptions or common mistakes that you see companies making when they do have good intentions, but might not be hitting the mark when they are kind of doing these strategies for the first time, which is okay, as long as their intentions are good, and they kind of fix that. But what have you seen in kind of your work there? I think something that's new, or and um, so I'm not, I wouldn't say it's a mistake right. yet. I think it's just uncomfortable because we haven't really, it's not prevalent, um, is starting to have real conversations um, about social issues. I think yeah. companies are still saying, hey, we're apolitical, or, you know, <laughs> don't bring that kind of, you know, these social mm -hmm. things into the office. I'm like, it, it's ridiculous. And then simultaneously say, like, bring your whole selves to work. Like, that's right. Real. Right. Um, my whole self, I think we're starting to see like bringing your whole self to work means the things that are going on, not just at home, but also like in the world. In the world. Yeah. As an Asian American right now, frankly, and I'm pretty loud and outspoken and bold. I'll be honest, I'm afraid to go to a Whole Foods at 2, 2 p.m. on Wednesday yeah. uh, by myself. Right. And so if you don't think that that affects that, what's going on in society is affecting my ability to do my work. Um, I don't know what to tell you, <laughs> right? right? That there's a huge disconnect there. And so I think more companies are starting to be more uh, understanding of, um, yeah, this idea of bring your whole selves to work or like we're a family. I'm like, 
no, <laughs> right? You're not if you're not addressing some of the real concerns that are going on um, socially, politically. Um, and you're starting to see companies take the stance on that, right? Especially what's going on in, in, in Georgia, right? And so um, that's, again, a lot of this is new. So I, I hate to say things are a mistake, but I think we need to start pushing ourselves into having real dialogue, real conversations, um, and not these, again, more celebratory, yes, for instance, APAM and some of the other cultural like months are coming up. Yeah. Um, there are time to celebrate. And again, pre 2020, sure. Have the potluck celebrate. Right. <laughs> right. Um, we're, I don't feel like we're in that place anymore and it's a balance, right? We're not, we're don't want to say doom and gloom all the time. Right. Uh, reality checks, right. It's, Hey, this is what's really going on, which also means celebrating like, our joy. Right. Um, so it's the balance of that. And I think if we're leading too far into, again, just like what's the great all cultural foods and traditions and such, then we're, com- we're kind of avoiding, you know, what's really going on in the real conversations that we ha- need to be had. And uh, employee activism is rising and they're smell, they're sniffing it out and they're calling it out. Right. So don't do that. <laughs> right. Um, or if you do acknowledge it and also create programming that is actually um, meaningful, authentic and, and bring your employees into the conversation. Right. Um, uh, I had another idea, but that's that's what I got for you for now. <laughs> no, absolutely. Bring your employees into the conversation is so important. It's a two way street and hard conversations are difficult for a reason. And people know when you're being authentic and when you're not being authentic. And I think that's really important to highlight as well. And I think a lot of the celebrations and the potlucks that you mentioned as well are definitely more surface level, but it's really digging into how to support employees, again, how to make uh, like real space for employees that is important. Do you have any kind of recommendations for companies to really authentically celebrate APAM in May um, and really just, you know, be intentional, especially at the moment we're in right now. Yeah, uh, I think something also interesting that I am seeing companies do is bring more uh, American history into the workplace, Mm -hmm. which I know when I was running programming, like that wasn't our job. I was very like, that's not, it's not our job to teach history in in the workplace. That's what we were supposed to do. Cool. However, different times now. um, And I really appreciate that. Um, I think for, you know, Black History Month, for instance, I think there were speakers who were talking about Black history, like actual history, not just what you've learned in school. I know that I'm doing the same thing with my partner, Jerry Wan um, of Dear Asian Americans. I'm also, I have, an again, my RISE program, so, um, which is focused specifically on Asian American identity. Part of our programming as we're going out for to do speaking engagements and keynotes and workshops is talking about Asian American history you know, giving context to what is going on today. Mm-hmm. I think it's been a myth to say like, or when folks think that this is just starting to happen now, that's false. It's not, right? right? This has been mm-hmm. ongoing. Um, and so that's been really eye-opening for allies, right? Um, and even API identifying folks um, to be, to understand their own history, especially their own um, activist history. And that creates more empowerment, right? I think that creates more of this groundedness of, oh, this is why I might, you know, be internalizing or say the model minority myth, for instance, for Asian Mm -hmm. American identity, right? I've internalized that for many, many years. I, Carissa Begonia, I have myself internalized that, which is why I was so focused on like developing my career. And I was hung up on meritocracy. I was hung up on, you know, climbing the ladder um, and not looking at some other, other ways of, of being, my authentic self, AKA the creative self like that I am, right? Um, and suppressing that for a long time. So um, so I think it's important to really understand some of that history, um, even, even if it's like, you know, it's high, high level and then start digging again into that personal, what, what are the stories that I, I have? So I often have my, I work with um, my coaching clients to do career development, leadership development um, or like business uh, coaching. I'm always digging into like, what is the, what's, what are your stories? I mean, give me the inventory of your own stories. And like I said, with my own journey, um, sure, I had this formal role, but what the most powerful part of that entire experience was really digging into my own personal stories, my own um, beliefs and, you know, why maybe I have these, this point of view or these, um, these ideas and like really, uh, standing um, with that conviction in that in what I'm doing and talking about, and that's when we want to then choose the outwardly the outward responses, right? When we when folks ask me, "Hey, Carissa, how do I 
Um, how do I speak up for myself? How do I speak up for my colleagues? How do I implement this ERG or this program at my company? Um, because but I'm, I'm hesitant. I say confidence comes from conviction and you only know what that convictions are when you look at your own stories. Yeah, absolutely. You will kind of be more comfortable with the external when you do the internal work and you're just like educating yourself, but also you have that foundation. And it sounds like there's a lot of learning as well and responsibility for companies to offer that space up. And then it's engaging in the conversation. And then of course, the third is to act and provide those resources and tools. And just as a company and bringing your authentic self to work, there's no, especially right now in terms of Zoom and the future of work and, you know, like potentially not meeting your coworkers for a long time. It's just, you know, connecting on that next level, wherever you can, that is really important. Are there any like tools or resources that you recommend for companies to really operationalize their DEI practices as well? Again, not relying on one person or one team to really create that inclusive workspace. Yeah. Um, Hire consultants. (laughs) (laughs) Hire experts. Yeah. Hire experts. There are um, a lot of experts. um, And like I said, when we're looking at diversity, it's, I think right now, top of mind is race. Um, And again, you know, I very much specialize in the API identity because that's what I know. That's what I've studied a lot of. Mm-hmm. Um, when I speak to folks, um, I speak to a lot of Asian Americans, for instance, about their career journeys, you know, their work in DEI, say, or even their, their work as business owners and entrepreneurs. Um, there's a, there's a, there's this kind of understanding that we have each other. There's a similarity in how we've maybe grown up, um, some kind of like cultural norms and such. And so I feel comfortable in that space, but, um, Specifically, I think, again, there's so many experts. Uh, Oftentimes, I think, um, again, we're tasked with knowing everything, especially when you're the singular person um, responsible for all of this knowledge, all of this programming, and not just from an identity standpoint, but from a functional expertise, you are right. I do not know someone who has 15 years of experience in marketing, HR, (laughs) (laughs) legal, like all of the things that you're supposed to know. Um, Yes, we have in a sense, but would you rather have someone who has spent that time in that job, in that role, in that functional expertise with the DEI lens, developing that out as well to, to, you know, consult or inform you and guide you and what you should, what your strategy should be in that particular vertical. Right. And so um, I, there are more BIPOC owned uh, consultancies springing up. I love to see that. Um, And Um, But yeah, like really, you're probably going to have to do a lot of work as that person internally to like, you know, see source and vet um, enough different consultants who have these different expertise um, to help support you. Right. And I know that is difficult. Um, A, there's no kind of hub that's just like, hey, we're, (laughs) I want to check the box for all these things. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You have to do the work. I think this is what we're saying. Like you, there's, there's an extra effort that needs to be put forward. Um, I think there's the, there's the, some maybe the maybe larger consultancies that are out there that, you know, but I challenge you to start looking at some of the more, the smaller, the grassroots ones. Um, and I'm also challenging folks to look at practitioners who, from my opinion, are looking at things with an anti-racist, anti-oppression lens, Absolutely. really people who are borrowing or not borrowing, but who are working, collaborating with folks in more movement and activist spaces. There's so much to be learned there. And even from a cross, um, you know, um, from, from just looking at different areas, so like nonprofits, the public sector, right? Um, for especially when I'm talking to, I, I talk a lot more to corporate entities um, and learning from each other there. There are different practices that I think a lot of times when I've spoken to these different segments, right? These areas, sectors, they're not speaking to each other. You know, right. the higher education, same thing, right? Um, and so I think diversifying, you know, your own network, I think that's one of the biggest things to be a DEI person, head of DEI, is that you're highly networked, you know, a lot of different people. Um, and you have this really great ability to both self regulate, um, again, um, understand what's going on for yourself for self care, as well as you're really influent, be able to influence folks. Um, in terms of taking action. Because again, we inherently own nothing, but we can can influence everything. So it's getting outside your comfort zone, looking at diversifying your network of of just, again, different experts and consultants um, to support you, uh, I think is is, going to be really important. 
Yeah. And I think that really speaks to intentionality and resourcing. And like you said, it might take a little bit additional time, but it's really important to support grassroots folks who are doing the doing the work and really living your values as well. Um, and I think there is a sense of a little bit of relief of not, you don't have to have all the answers, but you can do the work to find people who do have a lot of experience and expertise and just, you know, who are offering their services as well to help your organization and you as an individual. Um, you just need to do, do the work to find those folks and also pass their information along and just, you know, it's a whole network work and system, the systemic uh, piece of the puzzle that a lot of folks need to highlight as well. Yeah, well, something I'm beautiful that I've been finding as a DEI practitioner um, is that we want to help each other. Like mm -hmm. I, there's not this sense of competition, at least the network that I've built. Yeah. Me. Um, I think A, we all need each other because not just from this understanding, we, we don't have all the expertise that, you know, um, we can't right and like inherently by ourselves especially yeah. if a lot of us are singular consultants and not necessarily you know from from a larger consultancy um but you know it's it's been wonderful to be able to be, be able to pull um another person into a project and say like hey yeah. i don't do these assessments but you do or hey i don't you know look at this particular identity but you can speak on that right um hey i don't have time to do this one do you want to yeah. take it Right. And so uh, there's a lot of opportunity. And I think there's a lot of folks um, when we work collaboratively, um, I, I've my experience has been it's, it's been wonderful. Um, and I now that I just keep developing out my my network, it's like it's kind of I have these names I can just pull because I understand from, like, you know, being in house DEI as well, knowing that it's really hard to vet. It's hard to find the right person or like who you're just sometimes doing Google searches. Right. And, you know, looking at costs that you have, again, probably operating off of a limited budget and a limited time. You're now responsible for everything, all the KPIs and all the different again, business units, creating ERGs, a whole slew of responsibilities, right? Um, and so sourcing and vetting is, is another job, you know, there's, that's why recruiting is a thing, right? Um, but what I'll say is when you start to find, you know, maybe even ask like the consultants that you're working with, like, do you have folks for this and this and this? And mm -hmm. um, because I certainly have a lot of folks that um, I'm passing things too. Uh, um, and vice versa, that it comes to me too, when they are like, hey, especially so now, like Carissa, we need an Asian American speaker. Like, what are you doing on, you know, <laughs> May 5th? I'm like, what do you need from me? Right. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's just, again, this been this beautiful exchange between at least again, the, the DEI practitioners that I have come to become friends with. They're my new colleagues um, as independent consultants. Um, and I think we need each other. And so, and again, similar if, if you're, whether you're a consultant or in-house, keep developing those networks um, so that, you know, it's, it's never going to be a question of, I don't have a person, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's definitely a beautiful, it's a beautiful community to be a part of, and it's really intentional as well. And there is that element of just support and wanting to help one another. Are there any other, I know we talked about a lot today, but any other trends that you think that companies or individuals should really be aware of as they approach diversity, equity, and inclusion work in the future, whether it's over the next six months or year, to really, you know, think about being successful in their strategy? Yeah, um, like I said, I'm, I'm constantly going to be pushing a lot of that, that personal journey, that personal work, um, more often than not. Um, what it looks like, I guess, more in corporate speak is, is emotional intelligence. Um, uh, you know, if you start to look at more movement spaces, like this is some ancestral work that has been there. So yeah. I'm pushing for things that are anti-capitalistic, anti-patriarchal, anti-oppression. You know, I know that's uncomfortable for some organizations to, to call that out. Um, but that's the direction we're heading, folks. Um, that's, again, the network that I and building our folks more again for some movement spaces. Um, one thing that I am really exploring is restorative justice within, um, instead of like as maybe a, a replacement potentially for uh, for conflict resolution, say. But again, like really having when you're when you're putting yourself in different spaces outside of say corporate DEI, right? yeah. Meeting folks who are doing similar work in the especially. Uh, uh, social justice folks, right? There's so much, like, there's so much richness and information to to learn and to collaborate on. And that's kind of where I'm starting to move my practice towards is how do I, is more justice liberation spaces. And I'm finding companies are wanting to talk about that as well. And so, but there I do recognize there's a little bit of this, you know, sometimes unknowingness between the two 
parties say. And so for me, it's really recognizing what my role in social justice, for instance, is and social movements are. And um, I like to, again, have people think about like, what is your role, whether that's something formally, something again, that's just more inherent of you and your skill set and just, of just who you are, right? Um, I think I'm a natural character. So it makes a lot of sense when I'm moving into different spaces and trying to you know, take different ideas and put them together and, or apply them to different environments. Um, um, and I get a lot of excitement about that. And I get a lot of excitement to bring in different leaders to come together in that. So that's just what I've identified for myself. So I'd say there is, again, that there is systemic and there's personal interpersonal work to be done. There is both the tactical things as well as the emotional work that needs to be done. And it's a combination of the, all of those things happening simultaneously. So this is work and it's a constant learning and unlearning and it's not ever done, right? And so um, I think um, seeing more again, some of this history maybe coming into programming and like, you know, um, do leaders, does leadership need to go through their own kind of social justice 101 kind of, kind of program if they authentically want to put a statement out or if they authentically want to create programs, if they authentically want to hire not just a chief diversity officer, or, but a team, right. right? And put, move some of that maybe marketing funding into this, right? Like see, yeah. chief, like, diversity affects the entire business, pull it out of HR, it's the entire business. Yeah. But again, I think the disc, that's the systemic stuff. That's the operational tactical stuff. Oftentimes, again, leaders, as well as, you know, you know, your lowest level employee, I don't care. What is that personal work? What does it matter to you? Um, because if you don't know your own stories, you're not going to be able to even think or like accept or listen or hear that there is another story that is because it's so far and different from your own. So what is the connection? And I think all of us, whether it's in the workplace, this is something that we're experiencing outside of the workplace now. Right. It's it's just showing up there because of course it is. Um, and so this are, there's a responsibility that we all have. Um, and we have, we can do that from the seat that we're in, right? We don't have to go forget that formal DEI title. We don't have to, we can be doing this work um, no matter what, what place, what role we fill. And my challenge is actually that we are starting to move it forward and not just wait for someone to give us permission to do it. Um, it is your responsibility to participate. It is your responsibilities. Everyone here that everybody is empowered to do to do the internal work, which I definitely appreciate as well. And when you mentioned restorative justice, I actually have a conversation later this week from David at Amplifier J. I'm not sure if you um, are connected with him yet, but he is just so helpful in restorative justice. And I think that's a really important lens that a lot of kind of companies are looking to to implement in their kind of corporate practices as well, which is really exciting to see. Um, how can people get in touch with you if they would like to? learn more about your work or just would like to connect with you about the conversation we had here today? Yeah. So um, my website is consciousexchange.com. Um, my email you'll find there, just contact information there. I'm, I, my social media platform of choice is, is uh, LinkedIn. So definitely Great. look for me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. And I would say explore uh, specifically, specifically for folks who are a API identifying um, also arise community um, on Instagram. Cause we talk a lot about, again, um, how do we both understand our, where we've come from, from our historical standpoint, how do we um, process all of that emotionally and also somatically, right? Cause things we feel in the body, right? Resma mannequins Thank work you. on, um, you know, racialized trauma, that's all beautiful, but yeah, that's how you can find me. I'm excited to have these conversations. Um, please ping me. I think David, it's interesting. I met also through LinkedIn and I think oh, that's funny. Yeah, just reach out, right? Um, you never know. Also, hey, a lot of us are busy, so don't get offended. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> if, uh, it takes a while for a response. And thank you again for that, Grace. And I think, yeah, I think I'll just leave it with, you know, we're all doing, the, we're all learning and unlearning and doing the work. And I think having grace for each other that um, we're all at different places. Um, we're, I think if we, the call to action is do your best, try push yourself outside that comfort zone because that's where the growth is going to happen. That's where the change is going to happen. Um, and, and say yes. <laughs> I love that call to action. Thank you so much, Carissa. I really appreciate you kind of sharing your insights and just your experience with us here today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Christina. And yeah, um, thanks for the opportunity. And it was wonderful chatting with you.
It was wonderful chatting with you and nice to meet you virtually. And thank you to our viewers for listening here today. Again, in all voices, we believe in really empowering employees to speak up and know that when employees feel like they are seen and heard, everybody uh, succeeds at the organization. So thank you so much. Um, and I will talk to you soon.